his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace I can anticipate getting to the place, maybe I'm just being morbid, 
We get into the place where, like, Lord, I'm done. I'm, I'm good. I, I've lived my life. I'm happy. And I'm ready to lay it down. Uh, because there's a wearisome, there's a toil in this life, is there not? Yes. Yeah. And how many of us have, uh, how many of us have not experienced uh, calamity, uh, trials, deep wounds, deep hurts? And uh, but I'm, I'm grateful that this life is not all there is. And I'm, I'm grateful that Jesus is, is will make all things new. And then the point I really want to get to this morning is the fact that He's going to wipe away every tear. And I don't think there's anybody that is an exception who will be in God's presence on that day that won't have some tears that need to be wiped away. And what to me that communicates is this, this need for ultimate and final healing in our lives because of the things that, that God is, is leading us through. But what, what we've also seen is the fact that all these trials, these things that weigh heavy on our souls, these uh, dark nights of the soul, they, uh, they're intentional. Because they're an opportunity to bring God glory and to stand fast, fast and exercise our faith. And that, that's what Revelation is reminding us of, of, is all the calamity that's happening on the earth and all the toil and trial, both on the, the world stage and, and also in our individual lives, is intentional and, and it's an opportunity to, to bring God glory through all of that. So that's what I, I, and I want to get really personal with you towards the end. Just to encourage you so you can see your life through that lens. Because Jesus says the time is coming when no man can work. And the idea is now we have the opportunity to exercise our faith. So what does that look like in your life? And if you step back and say, you know, I'm, I'm just barely on the fringe of, of God accepting me uh, versus God, God loves you, knows what's going on in your life. And he wants to use you for his glory. And so the idea of we got to get past our own situation uh, to, to get to the place where we are laying down our lives for other people. And bringing, bringing glory to God in that, in this time. And then through doing, living a life that looks like that, we anticipate being face to face with God. We don't have, it's not something that's scary, like I'm not ready for it, like no, Lord, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So I want to encourage you with that this morning, but... As we look at the book of Revelation, uh, it's enigmatic. And the temptation is when we first come to it is to bring our, our modern day mindset to the text. And, and just instead of connecting the dots with the scripture, with the whole, all the rest of scripture, the temptation is to, to bring our, our modern day mind, mindset and project it upon the text. And uh, in order to, and, 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 and the result of that is just, it's, the, the book becomes very much mysterious. And uh, it, it's not just our time and our century that's doing that. Uh, Christians have attempted to do that throughout the centuries. They, I mean, every century has thought they're living in the time of the anti Antichrist, if you go back in church history. So we want to be careful of that, but we really want to pick up the meaning that's there in Revelation because we need it. And the illustration I often use is, you know, everything in the scripture is intentional. And if, if we just... If we misinterpret a whole book of scripture or we, we just dismiss it because it's too enigmatic, then, then it's like a vitamin or mineral deficiency. And, and what happens if you don't take vitamin C? You get scurvy, right? There, there's every trace mineral element that, that our body needs. It's nutrition so we can be healthy. And that's the same thing with scripture. Every book of the Bible is, is we need it so we can be healthy and mature. And... Uh, until we come to the full measure, the stature, and fullness of Christ. So, to that end, I, I want to play uh, a Bible project video on how do you interpret uh, the genre of literature called apocalypse. And uh, if you're not familiar with Bible project videos, they're, they're quite excellent. They're very academic, but then they're they're so accessible because they, they take big ideas and they make just make them so easy for us to, to get traction with. So uh, they've done a gr another great job with the, the apocalyptic literature. Before we play this video, I just want to ask for more blessing here this morning. Father, thank you that we can be in your presence. <coughs> and Lord, we're, we're honored that you send us as light out into the dark world. And Lord, what, what relevance does being a light have if, if there's no darkness to shine out into and so, Lord, we're grateful and we're honored uh, that you would call us on the same.
missing mission that you yourself entered into during your ministry. But Lord, we also get weary, we get emotional fatigue sometimes. And this life uh, weighs heavy on us. And these calamities that take us by surprise and things, Lord, and Lord, we just grateful that in your design you've called us to come in worship together and be in each other's presence, but even more importantly to be in your presence, Lord, because we need fresh uh, calibration. Lord, thank you. So thank you that you just call us together every week. Because, Lord, we, we need it, and all the benefits uh, are sometimes imperceptible. But, Lord, we, we need it. And, Lord, I want your people to walk away this morning refreshed and challenged, revived, and, and healed. So, Lord, to these ends, for your glory, for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do I have video on It's the end of the world. The moon turns to blood, mountains crumble, mutant locusts swarm. These are just some of the strange images we find in parts of the Bible called apocalyptic. And while most people think the biblical word apocalypse means the end of the world, it actually doesn't mean that at all. So let's talk about how to read apocalyptic what? literature in the Bible. So wait, the apocalypse doesn't mean the end of the world? No. Apocalypse is a Greek word that means to uncover or reveal. An apocalypse is when you suddenly see the true nature of something that you couldn't see before. Because I don't always see things the way they really are. Right. We all develop familiar ways of seeing the world that can limit or blur our vision. So an apocalypse is like a revelation. Right. Now, in the Bible, an apocalypse is when God pulls back the curtain to show someone what's really going on in the world from a divine perspective. For example, take Isaiah the prophet. He's suddenly transported in a vision into God's throne room. Oh right, he's in God's temple, described as a bridge between heaven and earth. And there, God gives him a divine perspective on Israel's past, present, and their future. So that Isaiah can bring challenge and comfort to God's people in his own day. Or think about the Apostle Paul, who was trying to stop the movement of Jesus, but then he gets stopped in his tracks by a vision of the risen Jesus himself. Yeah, he realizes that he's fighting against the very thing that he's been hoping for, and it changes the course of his life. So these apocalypses give people a heavenly perspective on their earthly situation, and they can give hope, or they can challenge you. Or make you change everything. Now, those are biblical stories about people having an apocalypse. There are also whole sections of biblical books where a prophet describes extended apocalyptic dreams and visions. People call this apocalyptic literature. And reading these dreams and visions is difficult. I mean, they're filled with strange images. Like, let's take Daniel. He sees ferocious beasts coming up out of a dark sea, trampling people on the land. And then a character called the Son of Man is exalted to rule the world. What is going on? Yeah, apocalyptic literature is written in a poetic, imaginative style, and it's packed with symbolism. How can I know what these symbols mean? Well, first, by studying the rest of your Bible. Apocalyptic imagery is based on biblical design patterns that begin in the book of Genesis and then develop throughout the Bible. Like the chaotic sea in the first sentences of the Bible that God tames but doesn't eliminate as he orders creation. And so the sea becomes an image of danger, death, and cosmic chaos. Ah, and the dry land, which comes out of the sea, is the safe order place where humans are supposed to rule as God's image. Yes, and also on the land, <coughs> beasts that humans are supposed to oversee. But keep reading, and the humans are deceived by a beast. And start acting like violent beasts. Exactly. Now, sometimes a prophet will tell you what a symbol means. Like in Daniel, we're told those beasts symbolize violent human kingdoms. But more often, the authors just assume you know how to trace an image through the biblical story to understand its meaning. Now let's look at the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, because it's one really long vision. The whole thing is an apocalypse. Yeah, and it works the same way. It begins with John the visionary, transported to God's throne room, where he sees the risen Jesus as the exalted king of the world. But Jesus is depicted as a bloody lamb. 
Right. It's a design pattern showing how Jesus is the sacrificial lamb from Israel's Passover and from the Day of Atonement. He gave his life for the sins of the world. And then John sees the ultimate beastly dragon, that spiritual power that energizes violent earthly empires. It's cast out by Jesus, the world's true king. Yeah. Now that reminds me. When I read the Revelation, I'm struck by all this cosmic destruction and violence. I mean, it happens over and over and over. Yeah, in the Revelation, there are three seven-part cycles of God's judgment. And it's another design pattern that connects together the stories of the Flood, the ten plagues on Egypt, and the exile to Babylon, and even more. These are moments when humans unleash so much violence and death into the world that God hands them over to self-destruction. It's like a reversal of creation in Genesis chapter 1, as God allows the world and humans to sink back into darkness and disorder. That's sobering. It is. But remember, in Genesis 1, God overcame darkness and chaos with his light and life. And so too in the Revelation. The death of Jesus, and the death of the world as we know it, is the pathway into the renewed creation that began with the resurrection of Jesus. And so while the Revelation feels like the end of the world... It's actually about the beginning of the renewed world where heaven and earth are reunited and God's human images rule all creation in the love and power of God. Okay, this is a lot to take in. It is, and there's a lot in these books that is still hard to understand, but the purpose of apocalyptic is really clear, to give us a heavenly perspective on our earthly circumstances so that every generation of God's people can be challenged, comforted, and given hope for the future. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Worthy is the Lamb who was killed, not the truth, power, wealth, and wisdom, and strength. I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, and was, and is to come. Do not be afraid of me. I am the first and the last. vision, I saw four heavenly messengers standing at the four corners of the earth. They were holding back the four winds so the earth wouldn't be destroyed from the wind violently rushing over the land or the sea or knocking down trees. <clears throat> then I saw a fifth messenger rising with the sun in the east. He was carrying the seal of the living God. He shouted to the four angels who were authorized to harm the land, the sea, and the trees. Do not harm the land, or the sea, or the trees until we seal the servants of our God with a mark of ownership on their foreheads. And I heard, and I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Yehudah, 12,000 were sealed. From the Uven, 12,000 were sealed. From Gad, 12,000 were sealed. From Asher, 12,000 were sealed. From Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. From Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. From Shimon, 12,000 were sealed. From Levi, 12,000 were sealed. From Yisachar, 12,000 were sealed. From Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. From Yosef, 12,000 were sealed. And from Vinyamin, 12,000 were sealed. And then I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes, held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar. And all the 
angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground, and worshipped God. They said, Amen. Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the twenty-four elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. And he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the sun. For the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. rendition of Revelation 7. Tommy, thank you so much for that. So I hope that uh, apocalyptic video was helpful for you. This is really good. In, it, the reason why I wanted that whole chapter just read to us just now is because it's, if you're not familiar with the text already, it's really difficult and challenging for you guys just to parachute in and start talking about concepts so if you haven't gone through the text first. So I hope that was helpful. Your mic. Oh, it's hanging on my shirt. Thank you. I, I'm not. I'm not fully on uh, all cylinders this morning. Uh, is that better? Thank you, live stream, for tuning in. Now you can hear me. Uh, <clears throat> so it's it's always helpful just when reading scripture, especially challenging scripture, just to read larger sections uh, versus you know. Just dropping in and uh, reading one verse outside of its context. So we do want to look at uh, Revelation seven uh, again this morning. There's, I feel like again we're just scratching the surface. But there's one uh, key concept in irony I want to tune you into on the front end. Starts out by saying, "Then I saw the angels standing." at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east carrying the seal of the living God. And notice the translation that was read just now says seal of ownership, and that's really what it means. And he shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm land and sea. Wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on who? On the foreheads of his servants. So what we saw earlier, two weeks ago, I think it was, maybe three, uh, is that the, the four horsemen go out in Revelation 6, but uh, John is now going back in time and saying before that actually happens, the sealing needs to happen. But notice the people, the 144,000 being sealed. Notice what they're called. I don't want you to miss this. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. They're called servants. End of verse 3 ends with this term, servants. Now, this, this term, servants, is doulos, which means slaves. Slaves. Now, God is calling us, I'm going to say us, or at least these 144,000 in this text, but in many other places in the New Testament, he's calling us slaves. Is that offensive to you? What's the essential property of the idea or concept of, of slavery? Being forced to do things against your will? You have no choice? I mean, these, these things are uh, run counter to our American uh, sensibilities, right? But I, I want to just define this word for us and, and kind of set it in its uh, ancient Near Eastern culture and context. This word is doulos, and the definition, the, the uh, dictionary definition is pertinent to being under someone's total control. Now, 
But there's an irony I want to end with, okay? There's a great irony because the Bible has these two seemingly contrasting concepts that we are slaves, but then also we are free. We have freedom in Christ. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So which is it? Are we slaves or are we free? Or do we have to need to, and does the New Testament have for us the idea of we need to reconcile those two things together to get a, a bigger picture of what the New Testament is communicating to us? And of course, the latter is always so true. And I love how, how often the New Testament, the, the Bible does that for us. So just to give you some background <coughs> on this word, because these New Testament writers use this word intentionally, but it's very offensive, especially when... Uh, when Paul has left Jerusalem and gone out into the Gentile world, the Mediterranean world, uh, he's going into a Greek culture. Uh, and this word was very offensive, yet he uses it. And what does he want to communicate through it? So the emphasis of this word is on serving as a slave. I can hardly see this. Me, there we go. And on the idea of serving not being a matter of choice. The slave has to perform his service whether he likes it or not. The slave is subject to the will, alien to his own, to the will of his owner. The word for slave, when compared to other similar words, contains the idea of the slave's dependence on his lord or master. That's key, dependence on his lord or master. So the idea of servitude is why ancient cultures like Israel and Egypt and others called their deity Lord. Uh, we shouldn't think that Jesus' first name is Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord has a cultural context from which it sprang and, the, the, and that the Bible grabs onto. And it's the idea of that these ancient culture, cultures saw the deity as a master and of course what what is their role in that relationship if, if the deity is master that means i'm slave slave to the master who is the deity <clears throat> so so the slave or doulos has total dependence on the master or lord and the lord <coughs> has total ownership of the slave, total ownership. So the slave, total dependence on the master. The master, total ownership of the slave. That's the concept being communicated. So we don't just call Lord as, we, sometimes we, we think of and use the word Lord as if it's a synonym for God. It's not, it's a cultural context from which it springs. It's the relationship that's being communicated is that of master and slave. Master is synonym for Lord. Now do you find that offensive? It's like, wow, you should have told me that before I became a Christian. I mean, you think about today's political climate and th this concept. So this idea, uh, so, so the Greeks, because it's a Greek word, right? So we should probably think about how they defined it. The Greeks found the idea of doulos repulsive, like offensive. Not because of the serving, but because the serving was not done in freedom. Every Greek citizen was called to serve the city-state but they did so out of their own free will. The only time doulos was seen as positive, according to, uh, say, Plato or Aristotle and their politics, uh, as positive was in reference to being a servant of the law. Greeks detested the idea of any man being dependent on another to live. So, the, so our, say, American idea and then even biblical idea of it takes a village, right? No one succeeds on their own. It always takes a community. That was, that's, that's foreign to, to, to the Greeks' culture. Because they were detested the idea of any man being dependent on another to live, especially in a master-slave relationship. Now, Jews saw non-Jewish slaves, because Jews had, there were Jewish slaves and non-Jewish slaves. They saw non-Jewish slaves uh, on the same level as immobile property. Immobile property. How would you like that to be your status in a society? For one Jew to call another Jew a slave was grounds for excommunication. What is excommunication? The idea of being put out of the community. Excommunity, right? 
<coughs> now, the Greek Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, and the New Testament then harness this word, doulos, or servant, slave, to mean service for, to God. Not, to, uh, not, in one, in, not in one isolated act, but the word doulos communicates total to commitment to God over the course of a lifetime. So, so it's not like you acted like a slave to the Lord <coughs> in one moment. This, this was characterizing your relationship to God over the course of a life. This is why Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, uh, and Israel, referring to future Israel, redeemed Israel, are, are called servants of God in our Old Testament. And this, the Greek version of the Old Testament, Septuagint, uses this word doulos. Now, there is also an exclusivity built into this word. Doulos. You have one master. Now, this is why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. What Jesus means by this is that it is a logical impossibility. People did have, in the time, they did have more than one master sometimes in the ancient world. They could be freed from one master, but not freed from the other. But Jesus is saying it's impossible to have two masters because in order to render the kind of service required by the master, demands, requires exclusivity. Because this, this word doulos, the slave, requires such a devoted and high level of service that if you had two masters, you couldn't render to either one the level of service required to fulfill the responsibility. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, here's the irony I mentioned. The irony of the term found in the New Testament, the more, here it is, I'm just gonna cut to the chase here. The more we exercise, and I'm putting those two ideas of freedom and slavery together, the more we exercise our will to enslave ourselves to Christ, the more free we are. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the New Testament is teaching us. The more we exercise our, our will, I could say free will, our own volition, Two, choosing to enslave ourselves to Christ, the more free we are. Free from what? Sin. Sin. Which, which the Bible characterizes sin as uh, bringing us into slavery, in bondage, what we might call addiction, things like this. Uh, so where do I get that from the, from the New Testament? I'll, I'll just give you a, three, uh, a few quick verses. Uh, Romans 6.6. 6. Romans 6.6 6 says, We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that, when you see so that, it's going to tell you the purpose or reason. So that, or result, so that sin might lose its power in our lives, we are no longer slaves to sin. John 15, 14 says, you are my friends, here's those two concepts put together, you are my friends if, conditional, if you do what I command. You have any kind of friendships like this? Where, hey, that's called conditional love, maybe? Like, you're my friend if you, if you do what I say? <coughs> are those gonna stay your friends very long? Uh, the reason why Jesus is doing this is one, he's God. Uh, he's our creator, he's our designer, uh, and he knows what's best for us. He is aware of the situation uh, that we are born into. Galatians 5.13, every time I talk about this topic, I always come back to this verse because to me this is the pinnacle verse in all of the New Testament. Galatians 5.13 you have been called to live in freedom. And if we go back to what Paul's already said, that freedom is freedom from slavery uh, to sin. You've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So you can begin to see why Revelation 7 is using this word doulos or slave because Jesus sets us free, but free to be slaves to God and then to serve other people. 
So that's why I say the irony is the more, and this is a truth and a principle we need to understand, the more we exercise our will to enslave our, enslave ourselves to Christ, the more free we are. Now what, what Paul is saying in Romans 6 is if you've been set free and you have the new nature of the Holy Spirit given to us, you have the choice now whether you go back to your old ways of enslaving yourself to sin or exercising your will to enslaving yourself to Christ and as a result experiencing freedom. So do you see the irony? So there came a point in my life, personal testimony, where I had to set aside my own will because I kept, I kept seeing, wow, that, the truth of, this, of this, uh, these principles. The more I was choosing my own way, the more I ended up and resulted, it resulted in me being a slave to sin. And so I had to put away my own will and say, Lord, whatever you have for me, I'm just gonna do that. Because what, what seems, the way, there's a way what seems right into a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's what I kept experiencing. And so the more I found that I enslaved myself to Christ, the more freedom I found, the more blessing I found. So Revelation 7 is written, is, he's talking to these 24,000. They understand this and they lived a life characterized by this. And they're sealed. And the idea of sealing, part of it is, and large part of it is the idea of ownership, saying that God owns these 144,000. Now, Jesus set the ultimate example for us. And if you're going to be a Christian, you have to understand this. Remember John 13, the foot washing. The foot washing. Did you know that Jews would not even allow Jewish slaves to wash their feet? Only non-Jewish slaves would be permitted. You know, the people considered as immobile property. Only non-Jewish slaves would be permitted. So John 13 teaches us that if Jesus is our master, then you will of necessity be a servant not only a slave of God, but to other people as well. Philippians 2 t tells us that Jesus took on the, the form uh, of a servant or slave. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, so you may not understand this uh, right now, but you'll understand it later. When Jesus uh, got down on his knees to wash the feet, he was communicating, like, like if I'm your master and your master is serving others, then to be my slave, to be my follower, to be my disciple, you have to serve others as well. Otherwise, I'm not your master. So he's communicating to his disciples, his apostles, who will then go out and communicate to others the life that Jesus is calling us to. It's a, he's calling us to a life of slavery that results in our freedom. Now, that's, that's who's being addressed here in Revelation 7, why verse 3 ends with seal, uh, with the seal of God on the foreheads of his slaves. Now, who are these 144,000? So every time we want to answer a question like that, we want to look at the, uh, a biblical referent or antecedent. And the, the clearest one I, I find is Numbers chapter 1. So when it says, I heard how many were marked with the seal of God, 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. And then it lists all the tribes. And I love that uh, Hebrew pronunciation of all those tribes. Well done, Tommy. Numbers 120 says, uh, in, this is the number of the men, 20 years old or older, who were able to go to what? War. War. And their names were listed in the records of their clans and families. Reuben, Jacob's oldest son, 46,500. Simeon, 59,300. Gad, 45,650. Judah, 74,600. Issachar, and so on. So what is happening is John uh, is harnessing that language from Numbers 1 to communicate that these 144,000, it's a military census. They're being called to go to battle. Now, there's that idea, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment, but there's also a, a reference, I don't think I got a chance to get to last time, um, with reference to the sealing. Not the sealing, but seal in, right? Sealing. By the way, something I, I didn't get a chance to mention, you know, there were, there were those in the first century who, um, who actually 
maybe this is too random, um, would tattoo themselves with the sign of a cross, uh, which is a, a letter of the alphabet, Greek alphabet, tau, uh, that in a, the letter tau is, is, is a T, and how ironic it is, those who said, I'm going to pick up my cross and follow him, would tattoo themselves this way. So there's a sense in which those who took up their cross, enslaved themselves to God, um, what, what is the idea of cross, taking up the cross? Built into that is, all, I mean, it's the idea of submission, but it's also the idea of people who are holding the cross, taking up the cross, were on their way to die. Yes? So it's just interesting that taking up the cross, they would use this tattoo, and they considered this a ceiling and a symbol. So in that idea, you have all these ideas converging together, and how ironic is that? But Exodus 28, 21, I'm going to give you this quick reference. The stones, in, in this chapter, the, uh, the, the vestments, the high priestly robes are being communicated, how to, how to fashion them. Uh, the robes for the high priest. The stones shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel. And these are the stones, the 12 stones that are going to go on the breastplate that the high priest will wear on the day of atonement. 12 according to their names, they shall be like the engravings of a what? Of a seal. Each according to the name for the 12 tribes. Skip down to verse 36. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal. Holy to the Lord. You shall fasten it on a blue cord, and it shall be uh, on the turban. It shall be at the front of the turban, that's a hat. It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate with regard to all the holy gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead, they, that they may be accepted before the Lord. So we had to have a ceiling, the high priest had to have a ceiling, seal in on his forehead uh, as part of his being consecrated or made holy so that he could approach, approach the Lord on the day of atonement. Uh, what, what is happening, I, I see in Revelation 7, is saying that this ceiling is happening now for, remember the, tor, the veil was torn in two at, at the result of the re crucifixion and resurrection? The veil was torn in two. So, so it was no longer just that one man, the great high priest, could enter into God's presence. Now that way, because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, made a way for all of us to enter into God's presence. Jew and Gentile alike. So, the background of, of Exodus that I've just read provides this link between Revelation 21 and Revelation 7. The precious stone, because the 12 stones are mentioned there as well. The precious stones and the seal of Exodus signify a people made holy through the sacrifice of the Lamb to enter the new Jerusalem built on these precious stones as its foundation. The community of the redeemed in Ex uh, Revelation 7 is the same as in Revelation 14, 1 through 4, because the verbal parallels and ideas observed above. In Revelation 14, 3 through 4, the 144,000 are those who have been purchased from the earth and who have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God. And there is a parallel between Revelation 14.4 and Revelation 5.9, which is so close that the groups mentioned as purchased in both are probably identical. Now, let me read to you those passages. Revelation 14, which is the only other passage where the 144,000 are mentioned at the beginning, says this. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and before the 24 elders. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had what? Been redeemed or purchased from the earth. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the lamb wherever he goes. They have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. So what, what's being said here is that the, the description of the 144,000, Revelation 14, Revelation 7, is the same as that described in Revelation 5, 9. I think you'll see why. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So what is, what is the, uh, the, the link 
the common thread between those two groups, 144,000 and this innumerable crowd. Well, here the one I'm drawing attention to is the fact that they, have, they are redeemed or ransomed or purchased people. And of course, how were they purchased? Through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So this would mean that the 144,000, according to my interpretation, um, in Revelation 14, 1 through 3, are not some small remnant of ethnic Israelites, but rather a way of speaking of a larger remnant of humanity living during the church age whom Christ has redeemed throughout the world. And if this identification is correct, then the 144,000 in Revelation 7, 3 through 8 must also represent the same redeemed remnant from all over the earth. In this case, Revelation 7, 9 would interpret the group of Revelation 7, 3 through 8 as those who are from every nation and all tribes and people and tongues. So this group is numbered as 144,000 to emphasize figuratively that this is a picture of the church in its entirety, not in part, which has been redeemed as the vision of the multitude in seven, Revelation 7, 9 through 17 bears out. So, lest there be any doubt that the 144,000 are not ethnic Israelites, John does much the same thing uh, in Revelation 3.12 by calling Gentile Christians the New Jerusalem. So if, he calls ethnic, uh, if he's calling these Israelites from these different tribes, if, if I'm arguing that it actually represents the church complete through all the church age, it is very similar to what John has already done by calling Gentile Christians the new Jerusalem. And I'll just read that passage for you as well. Because you say this, this is not one isolated incident where a New Testament writer makes a link between, uh, say, uh, Israel, as it was understood in the Old Testament, as being the people of God, but it's actually all throughout the New Testament. And it's all throughout Revelation as well. Uh, and these, these begin to add up, and you can begin to see this is not some stretch. This is the fact that it's, it's, it, what's being communicated is through the genre of apocalyptic literature. So Revelation 3.12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He's writing to, communi uh, to Gentile Christians saying, your identity is new Jerusalem. So you could go back and read those passages. I know I'm moving quickly. Wow, is that correct? Let's just cut to the practical application then. Now, why speak of a specific, why the 144,000? Why speak of 12,000, 12 times 12,000? Well, in Revelation 21, 12, we read of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles together form the foundational structure of the New Jerusalem. Multiplying 12 by 12 equals 100, uh, 144, representing the entire, as I'm arguing, the entire people of God through the ages. Multiplying that figure by 1,000 reinforces the notion of completeness. So we read that in Revelation 21, 12. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. These were, there were three gates on, the e on each side, east, north, south, west. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So that's what I think is being communicated. Obviously, there are, there are those who out there, they are in the minority, actually, as far as in, uh, academic uh, scholarly literature, those who believe that the 144,000 are actual ethnic Israelites who will come into existence, who happen to be virgins, uh, come into existence during a seven year tribulation right before the second coming which is uh, right before the, the 1000 year millennium they are in the minority but there are there's those out there now in the pop culture of, the, uh, of Christian literature uh, it seems to be the majority but when you go to scholarly academic literature and do research you find that those who think uh, Israel is ethnic Israelites in the seven year tribulation are, are greatly in the minority 
that's a new idea in the church, uh, in the church age. And uh, it, is, it is definitely not the majority, but the, it just so happens, I'm just letting you know, that the church at large in America, what I call church pop culture, thinks that it is the majority. But it would be hard pressed. Uh, well, statistically speaking, the, the number of, of scholars that, that, that believe this position uh, compared to scholars who believe the position I'm presenting to you, um, the scholars that believe this position that I'm presenting vastly outweigh those who hold to ethnic Israelites being the 144,000, just so you know. Now, that is not a good enough reason to believe it because just because a lot of people believe something doesn't make it true, okay? Because that would be a logical fallacy ad populum, right? But I'm just saying the, the, it's, it's something to consider. I'll leave it at that. So when Revelation 14, 4 how do they describe the 144,000? They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been purchased, redeemed from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. They have told no lies. They are without blame, in keeping with the um, and this. So this is in keeping with the idea of a military census in Deuteronomy 23:9. Now. It, part of the, this image of military census, they were to keep themselves pure. So Deuteronomy 23.9 says, when you go to war against your enemies, be sure to stay away from anything that is impure. But when we, we have this idea in the New Testament as well, 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, for I am jealous for you, Paul says, with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you, Corinthian church, as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. So if you just stop right there, and what, what I'm saying is true, what, what in large part is being communicated is how God sees us. And that's why I'm asking us the idea of like, how do you see yourself? Like, I think a lot of times we're not empowered to live, up, to live out fully the life God has called us to because we see ourselves on the fringe of Christianity just barely getting in because we carry our shame with us when Jesus, um, into, our, into our faith when Jesus is desiring to set us free from all that. Another idea, we'll come back to that, but another idea, a uh, reason why it would be mentioned as pure as virgins is because that's, that's what Israel kept being called in the Old Testament. There's plenty of instances there. I'll just read one of them, Jeremiah 18, 13. So this is what the Lord says. Has anyone heard of such a thing even among the pagan nations? My virgin daughter Israel has done something terrible. And it's notice that Israel is still called a virgin daughter. Virgin, so what is being said when, when they're called virgins? What is the biblical concept? Is it talking about sex? Because <laughs> that is what a lot of people are thinking as far as pop culture Christianity. Is it talking about sex? They haven't had sex. The, the biblical concept that is throughout the scripture is the idea of, it uses this metaphor of virginity. What, what's the antithesis of the virginity in the biblical concept? Idolatry. That's why in Revelation, what is the ultimate idolatry called? The great harlot or great prostitute. So virgin in juxtaposition to prostitute. Do you see that? That's the biblical meaning. Not, he's not talking about sex per se. He's talking about fidelity to God. These people are faithful to God. And using the apocalyptic genre, using this word concept of virgin to communicate this, he's not talking about their sex life or lack of one. I think that's clear because the, this idea of uh, be, being virgin, that's why Israel is called the virgin. That's what they're called to be. Virgin, um, it means f uh, faithful to the Lord. What did they often end up doing? They, were, they prostituted themselves, the text often says, to I idols. So that's the biblical concept. It, so it's not like, uh, man, I was, I was gonna be, I'm in the seven year tribulation. I was about ready to be qualified to be one of the 144,000, but then I got married. So then I was disqualified. I, I don't think that's what's happening at all. Some do. And um, again, I want you to come to your own conclusion, do your own homework. So the reference to not lying, because I remember reading this as a kid, I think, wow, they never told one lie? Like, that's supernatural. Like, how is that possible? They would have to be Jesus. 
the reference to not lying is not merely is not speaking merely of general truthfulness, but in context focuses on the saints' integrity in witnessing to Jesus. When under pressure by the beast and false prophet to compromise their faith and go along with the idolatrous lie. As already briefly stated, the expression of integrity or not lying, is an allusion to the character of the messianic servant prophesied in Isaiah 53. Quote, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We all know the famous passage Isaiah 53, right? Referencing Jesus in the Old Testament book of Isaiah where it says that Jesus is like a lamb led to a slaughter. Basically, it's communicating substitutionary atonement. Jesus is going to die in, in, uh, in behalf of or in place of his people. And Jesus in that text in Isaiah 53 is described as not having any deceit in his mouth. Now this is striking because it comes immediately after the mention of the servant as a lamb that is led to the slaughter. The saints reflect both of these messianic traits. So what it's saying is the church are those who as a pure bride never compromise their witness by bowing down to the beast empire as it were but they also are willing to be slaughtered you know this this word slaughter has the idea it's really means in its most literal form or in original form means a, a small slit on the neck with reference to a sacrificial animal so it's the idea of big picture is what, what's being communicated is the way because all through the letters to the seven ch churches in, in Revelation 2 and 3 the idea of we are going to be overcomers and the way what we overcome is the ironic same ironic way that Jesus overcame is when you think it's it's all over and done Satan won and put Jesus on the cross and killed him here comes resurrection power it's through submitting to the slaughter but it's maintaining your faithful witness amongst the trials and calamity of life that we are victorious so what is being communicated it's not that Jesus is seeking to give us relief from all our problems he's seeking to give us a sealing of the Holy Spirit to lead us through the dark night of the soul but while simultaneously maintaining our faithful witness to him and through that bringing him glory. The, what is he communicating? He's communicating the life that we're called to. This is what Jesus, this is the mission Jesus has for us. And I always like to go back to the King James translation of Job 13 where it says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I find that such a beautiful image and expression. So, we are to be like Jesus in the fact that there was no deceit found in his mouth and he was willing to uh, be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the idea of the martyrs, those slaughtered in Revelation also is figurative language because that, that is way, the way that God sees his church is uh, we're all martyrs, called to be martyrs. In what sense? In the sense where Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Those who have taken up their cross, if you take that image with the idea of martyr or slaughtered in, in Revelation, what we have is through dying to sin, dying to self, our fallen self, we enter into a subject, we subject ourselves to his will and we become slaughtered martyrs. Because, how so? Because we've taken up our cross to follow him. So the idea of you can be a Christian where you kind of go on about your life the way you did before you, Christ found you is, is definitely not a New Testament concept. So again, we keep coming back to this idea that Jesus you know, knows our heart. He will say unto them, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. And it's the idea of there are no nominal Christians in reality. That is to say, you can't be a Christian in name only is what's being communicated here. 
So Revelation 19, 14, again, describes the same group when it says the armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on the white horses. So again, in keeping with this idea of military census, it says the armies of heaven these are the ones who are dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. Again, just another reference. We'll get to that down the road. Now, for sake of time, goodness gracious, I just want to go to the end of this verse, to, uh, chapter, to encourage you. I just want to reread this, and we're going to be done. So just bear with me, please. I appreciate your patience. Did that clock, clock start at the beginning of the video or when I started? Okay, good. I feel a little bit better, but I'm, nevertheless, I'm, going to, I'm almost done. Again, I told you I could only scratch the surface this morning. Revelation seven fifteen, the end, of, the very end of the chapter, uh, it ends this way. Oh, let me back up. I gotta say this. Notice it says, "I heard the no, the number of those sealed, twelve thousand from each tribe." Right? It says, "I heard." But then Revelation seven nine says, "I looked and I saw." A crowd too great to be numbered. Now, wasn't it promised to Abraham that he would have, he would have offspring that were uh, could not be numbered, greater than the sands on the seashore? You ever been to the seashore? Looked at the sand? It's a lot. It's a lot. There's more stars in the universe though than than sand on our seashores. Isn't that awesome? And there's it's also an illustration God uses to Abraham, but. <clears throat> So what, what is happening there is the same thing in Revelation 5 where it says, um, I, I heard a lion, but I looked and saw a lamb. I think I've said this before. I think that's the same thing. That same pattern of hearing something, but then looking and seeing something else is, is John using the apocalyptic genre of literature to communicate a, many things about one group or person or whatever. So that is why, another reason why, I could keep going on and on about why, but another reason why I think the 144,000 are the same thing as the multitude that has been gathered, redeemed, or purchased from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. Because nation, tribe, language, and tongue throughout the rest of Revelation is used of the people who reject God and follow the beast. So what's happening is from the group that are following the beast, God redeems or purchases a remnant that are being communicated to us, being described as 144,000, a military census, but then they end up being to uh, a multitude that you can't even count. So what's being described is, if those two groups are the same, is the church in its entirety from beginning to end. Now, Having said that, Revelation 7, 15. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in the temple. They've just come out of the great tribulation. We don't have time to talk about the great tribulation today. We will talk about it. You should uh, look at probably Jeremiah 31 in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, if you want uh, Old Testament reference on what that means. But Revelation 7, 15 uh, in verse 16, they will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. What I think that's, that mean, that the meaning there is, is these coming to the great tribulation during the church age, we, have, we experience these things. This is figurative or metaphorical language to communicate the trials that we are called to, to navigate through in this life. And so even while we're being faithful and uh, bearing faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel during our life, we experience uh, hunger and thirst and scorching by the heat of the sun. Think of all the trials that people endure. We have people in our church right now enduring trials. So even though you're faithful, you still take an emotional baggage hit, if you will. Do we not? And some of us have encountered that. We get to the level of maturity where things get even harder. But because we've been strengthened and sealed by the Holy Spirit, we're even more equipped to tackle that. Whereas before, we might have been tempted like Jonah to run away. Now we say, bring it, because I know God will supply. And that's what you have to understand is, when he calls you into the darkness, he doesn't leave you hanging. He walks by you, right? That's what Psalm 23 is all about. The Lord is, is our shepherd. He leads us through the valley of darkness. But simultaneously in the valley of darkness, he sets a, a feast or a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He doesn't get rid of the enemies during this life. He, he, he makes a place of security and safety 
in our darkest trial through the exercise of our faith. That's what Revelation is communicating to us. So we should not be afraid because if you're always afraid and full of fear, how are you gonna fulfill your mission that God is calling you to? He's going to be there to provide for you when you need it. Probably not before because the faith is required, right? So verse 17, I gotta quit. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them so the lamb becomes the shepherd. Isn't that awesome? He will lead them to springs of life-giving water, Psalm 23 again, and will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now this is taking two uh, Isaiah passages, Isaiah 49 and Isaiah 25, and I'll just take out where Isaiah 49 says, um, let's see, verse, uh, verse 10, um, they will neither hunger nor thirst, the searing sun will not reach them anymore, for the Lord in his mercy will lead them, he will lead them beside cool waters. Do you see how it's a direct quote? Now, if you look at the Isaiah passage, it's talking to Israel, but yet the fulfillment in the New Testament is to the whole church. Again, we can just keep going again and again and again that we find Gentile you know, people who become Christians who are not Gentiles anymore and there's not Jews anymore because we're one in Christ, Galatians 3, 28 through 29 tells us. But the, the fulfillment to Old Testament promises made to Israel is, is fulfilled in the, to the church again and again and again in the New Testament. Here's yet another example. But it's also part of Isaiah 25, which is one of my favorite Old Testament passages because he says in verse seven, there he will remove the cloud of gloom. And another translation, more little translation, is like he's going to remove this cloak of death that we're all wearing right now. So we take off the cloak of death and put on the robes of righteousness. Ah, oh, as we enter into immortality. I mean, that, that's, that's a huge promise. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all the insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. I could go on, and that day the people will proclaim, this is our God, we trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation that he brings. We trusted in him during that, that, the dark night of the soul. And look at the salvation he has brought. It wasn't that he, he made promises to us, and we endured all this tri these trials and persecution, putting our hope in him, and that we found it to be a lie because we woke up into oblivion when we died. No, we woke up into eternity and found out that everything he said was true. And this is meant to encourage us in Revelation to say, hey, the, the hopes, the promises, they are true, they are coming true, but maintain faithfulness, your faithfulness, your witness in the meantime. I gotta stop. Man. Yeah, I gotta stop. I wanted to get to my practical application and share a testimony from one of my heroes. No, let's take a vote. You want, I need five more minutes to do this. Okay, okay. Five. Look, at, I, I want to share something very personal with you. Uh, you going to set a timer, someone? I'm on to you. Because you're on to me. Look at, I, I, had a, I just want to share a personal testimony with you because to me it speaks volumes of everything we've been talking about this morning. Uh, one of my heroes is actually my cousin Aaron, Aaron Keller. And uh, he's younger than me. I don't know if he's five years younger, seven years younger. Uh, he lives in uh, Clovis, California, which is outside of Fresno. And uh, he is one of my heroes. I don't know if he knows this. His son, 14 years old, uh, went to be with the Lord uh, a week and a half ago. And through most of, and his son's name was Elijah, and through most of Elijah's life, um, he was suffering what's called Mount Batten's disease, which is a very rare disease. Very few people uh, get it, but it rendered him completely immobile and kind of like this. I remember him before he this disease came upon him. He's such a precious kid. Now, if that were to happen to you, you know, our temptation in our flesh, it might be to say, be angry at God. 
right? Like, God, why? But what I saw from Aaron is that he responded, and because he is sealed, because he has a strong faith, what the faith that he exercised has been such a monument to, to what a true, genuine hero of the faith looks like. And I, I feel like all of his writings that he wrote throughout this period, because like his, his, he and his wife would have to take shifts, four-hour shifts throughout to get Elijah through the night, every night. And I feel like if he took his collected writings that he, he would keep kept posting on Facebook, it's like it should be published as a devotional. But this is what he wrote uh, a few days after Elijah's passing. And to me, this communicates, it shows, to, shows you why he's one of my heroes, and it just communicates someone who's being filled with the Spirit even during the darkest times. And I hope it, it encourages you this morning. It says, Aaron writes after losing his son, he says, I miss him so much. My whole body hurts for the pain of, uh, of loss. I see my boy's face as just a memory. I can't see him anymore. I can't touch his face or call out his name. I can't read to him anymore and, and have our quiet moments together. I hurt so much like a knife. It has been driven in my heart and it has been twisted. Right now, all I can feel is the pain. Everywhere I look, I see him. On the grass where we, where we would lay, the place where his bed was and the chair I sat in, the street I pushed him down for our walks when, I was, when it was not painful for him. His socks, his clothes in the closet, all his medication in the cupboard, just about all the places I see, he's there. It is so quiet here. He's not breathing next to me. His chest does not uh, rise. His eyes don't look about the room for the noises he hears. There is no music playing, no waves roaring in the distance. It is only me here without him. Every night it was he and I in the living room. It's, now it's only me in the quiet. I don't know how I will be able to do this. When the hurt hits me so hard, I can't run from it. I can't hide from it. It's a fierce battle I must fight, and I feel alone in it. I can't see the days ahead without him. I see darkness and loneliness at every corner, but that is how I see it now. I know there is more to come. I just can't see it yet. It is like this pain is a part along the path, and I must walk it. But I see even in the stillness and quiet, all the dark around me, I see I am not really alone. I only feel that I am. I am a mess and I am broken, a human man with all the depth of love and life as all those around me are. What would love really be if it could not be lost for a moment? How cherished is it when peace is all there is? How cherished is it when peace is all there is, when it has no contender, nothing to strive for, no fire to build it? A child in a constant state of bliss, he can never grow or learn with no challenges or risk. I can't see how truly deep his love is without the hurt of loss. There was never any struggle to test it, never any challenge to shape it. Here is where the Lord takes me tonight to ask me, what did you really want? What were you expecting? What kind of giver of life would I be if you could only keep something once, only for your hands, for your hands alone? Do, did you think these short years was all there was? There is so much more I want to give you. You see, I did not take from you. The gift is still there. It is something greater and more eternal than just 14 years of life. I am unloading blessings you cannot bear. I set joy down before you, too weighted for you to carry. And my child, you are not alone. Listen in your pain. Take hold of my promises. Meditate on my love for you. Breathe in all my grace. Finally, the language of my love. My presence is more and real. It is not the temporal things in your hands, the peace you feel now and the tears you poured out. I am there. I am here and I always will be. Trust me, 
I am working my plans with you. Who responds like that? That's like supernatural Holy Spirit empowered response to a massive calamity that I can't even fathom. But my cousin Aaron does. That is the response Jesus is calling us to in these times. Now you imagine on that day when he sees his son Elijah again. And I just imagine Elijah saying to Aaron, he's like, Dad, thank you so much for bringing glory to our God by being so faithful. And Lord, and, and Dad, thank you so much for taking such good care of me and being faithful this whole time. Glory to God. Because it isn't the end, is it? Elijah gets a new body. He's restored. <laughs> and father and son see each other in a way they had never had before. And all in the presence of the Lamb who made all this possible. So if I, I say to myself, if Aaron can do that in such a massive thing, Timothy Keller can do it in all these little small things. Little, every trial I can think of that I've ever had is, is so trivial compared to that one. I can't even step to that. I can't even fathom that. So can we remember? That's the beauty and that's the glory that is our opportunity now. And if we don't have that perception, then we're always whining and complaining about how terrible things are, but we never step into that place of beauty that God is willing to equip us to, to, to express. So that's why we say that the worst things, the most challenging things about our life, we have to see them for what they are, opportunities to bring God glory to strengthen our faith, and through that, come to know more and more fully his divine presence, his enabling, transformative presence. So if you haven't ex experienced great calamity yet, you, you will. How can we not? It's the stage upon which we get to exercise this beautiful faith. And I hope that was encouraging to you. I hope one day Aaron will be here and uh, can share more of his testimony. Uh, he's taking his family for a healing trip to the Grand Canyon this week and I'm really happy for that so last thing this is the lens everything we've been saying this morning is just the lens through which we are to interpret everything in life I hope it encourages you and you feel equipped to do so let's pray Father Lord it's heavy and Lord you don't you cut to the chase and Lord we're grateful that you tell us how it really is you don't make false promises saying everything's going to be fine all your problems are going to go away when, when you just put your faith and trust in Jesus it's like no you're going to lead us through the dark night of the soul, but you're never going to leave us nor forsake us. And through that, Lord, I can't help but know and understand that you're preparing us for something even greater, that you're developing something in us now so that we can serve you even a greater capacity in the age to come. So, Lord, help us to not miss the opportunities. But, Lord, thank you for the new identity that you've given us, one of sons and daughters, but also slaves. Slaves who serve out of their freedom. So Lord, not, help us not to miss any of us, uh, this. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that you would just help us to see what this looks like in our own context. That there's great freedom in willingly taking up our cross, dying to self, but living for the glory of God. And becoming our story becoming part of the greatest story ever told. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would equip your people and uh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, reveal itself um, to, to those who may not yet know you watching on live stream or wherever and uh, Lord, that they would come to know your presence supernaturally, experientially. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate your patience this morning. You are dismissed to fellowship.